Hey guys, I'm, I'm Jacob Holland, Director of Operations around here, and uh, man, I'm excited. Uh, we've had a couple weird weeks recently, but hey, here we are, and we are excited to be here. Uh, hey, I'm just going to, I know, it's church, it's Sunday, we're supposed to be super holy and whatnot, but you know what, I can't, I can't help it. 31 years, 31 years I waited to send a text message saying the Bengals have won a playoff game. Text messaging didn't even exist the last time. Rebecca asked me yesterday, who, who did they last beat? I said the Houston Oilers. She said, who? Exactly. The Oilers. They don't even, they're not even here anymore. We finally did it. Uh, it took us 58 minutes and what, what, what is it? 58, 59 minutes and 58 seconds or something crazy. 12 seconds. It came down to the end. The Bengals beat the Raiders, sorry Bob, for their first playoff win in 31 years. Now, if you were watching any of the lead up uh, to the game, you would assume that that was what was going to happen, right? All the experts said Joe Burrow's great, the Bengals are great, they're going to win, they're going to do awesome, it's going to be them, they're going to pull off the Raiders. Yes, the Raiders lost their head coach and like every single receiver, and they've won six walk-off games, and yes, it's improbable that they're there, but the Bengals were going to win, and everyone, all these announcers, all the analysts, they all expected it, but me, as a Bengals fan, I had no expectations they were going to win. I assumed beyond anything else that they were going to lose. I was just waiting. I was like, we're going to fumble the knee, right? We're going to fumble it right here. They're going to recover the fumble and into the end zone. I knew it was coming, but it didn't. They defied all expectations and finally won. Now, I didn't just you do all this to, uh, to just boast about the Bengals. I am really excited, but the reality of it is uh, it kind of it led me to expectations, right? Because I did not have the expectation of winning. I had the hope, but hope means nothing, right? Uh, it comes down to expectations. And expectations is something that each of us have, right? We, we either have expectations or we have expectations thrust upon us, right? But we all deal with it. We had expectations of 2022. This was going to be a good year. We had expectations last week that Pastor Kevin was going to get up here and he was going to announce the vision for 2022, how God is moving and the direction we're moving in. But on Saturday night, everything fell apart, right? And we were, so we, uh, we had to cancel church and kind of re regroup. We're going to do it next week. And this week, up until Wednesday, I was expecting him to get up here and preach that message of 2022 of here is what God's doing. It's going to be incredible. But he wasn't right, quite there. So uh, on Wednesday, the ball fell in my court. Now, me being a pragmatic person and understanding, I don't think church has to be centered around a sermon, right? That's a very Western theology where we're, we need three songs, we need a sermon, we need some prayer, and that's it, right? So I was fully expecting us to move into a time of prayer today of, hey, let's focus on, you know, rock kids, or let's focus on this prayer, or on, our, on what we're going to do for our community. And that was kind of my expectation. But as I prepared a short 10-minute talk, God made it quite clear that that wasn't his expectation of today. And I came out with a sermon in like 25 minutes. So uh, I don't do that, by the way. This is, a, uh, this is a from the Lord or else I wouldn't be up here preaching. But this idea of expectation kept coming back to my mind. And I think God wants to do some work on our expectations today, right? If, to, if next week we're going to launch 2022 with this new revised vision to see incredible things done in our community, the reason that we're not doing that last week or this week is that God still has to deal with some of our expectations, right? So we're going to do that today. We're going to talk about expectations, and it's all going to come together. So let's pray one more time. God, we thank you. We thank you that you are in control, God. And even in the midst of a global pandemic, even in the midst of just some of the worst situations imaginable, God, you are still God. And we can still expect you at the end of the day to be God, God. So we, we lay down our expectations of what we thought today was going to be. We lay down our expectations of what we thought this world was going to be. And God, we just lift, our, lift up this sermon, this message, this heart, uh, this group of people, and we say, come, Holy Spirit, do incredible things. And we pray all this in your name. Amen. Today, I'm going to talk to you out of the book of Matthew. Just a few verses today. I'm going to keep it short. Don't worry. But out of Matthew 11, starting in verse 2, 
there's a cool story that happens, a cool interaction. I want to read it to you. So when John, who this John is John the Baptist, was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come or should I expect someone else? Jesus replied, go pack and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the death hear, the dead are raised, the good news is proclaimed to the poor, and blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. So as I was preparing to what should we pray about, this is the verse that came to my head. It didn't make any sense. I mean, it kind of does. I get the latter half of it, what the ministry of Jesus and what we're being called into, but I was confused of why this out of all of Scripture is what came to my head. Uh, so as I dove in, I realized I really need to understand these two parties, right? There's two people involved in this story, three if you count the disciples of John, but they're just, the, they're just Aaron boys. They're just, you know, they're the telephone, if you will. So uh, he would have sent a text, but we didn't have text back then. So that's what the disciples are there. But we have two different people. We have Jesus and we have John the Baptist. Jesus is pretty much known by almost everyone, right? Jesus is probably the most famous human being to ever have lived on the world. Uh, he was the son of God. He came from heaven. He was, he was, his birth was proclaimed by angels. He was born out of the divine intervention. Uh, he, he lived a perfect sin-free life. He, he came, he lived as the Messiah, he di lived a sin-free life, died on the cross, and was raised from the dead three days later, right? If you are a Christian, or you have been around a Christian church, or you have been around the world in any capacity, you have heard the name of Jesus. Now, John the Baptist, he doesn't get as much fanfare, right? He appears, he pops up, he, does a, he says a couple things, and he, he baptizes Jesus, and he's kind of out, right? So most people know that John the Baptist is the cousin of Jesus, most people have an understanding that he was out in the wilderness of Judea preaching. If you really press someone, they may remember that he was wearing camel hair and a leather belt around his waist, right? And if you really, really press that, someone may remember vaguely that he ate honey and bugs or something like that, right? Honey and locusts, right? And to a lot of people, that's kind of their understanding. It's this wild man who wears camel clothes and eats bugs in the wilderness, right? And that's kind of, that's how we present John the Baptist. And I think that is a, a very shallow and disingenuous interpretation of the man of John the Baptist. Because in reality, outside of Jesus himself, I think John the Baptist is the most theologically important person in the Gospels, written in the Gospels. He doesn't get the limelight he deserves. He pops in and he pops out. But here's the thing. John the ba Baptist, his birth was proclaimed by angels, just like Jesus's, right? An angel came and said, hey, you're going to have a son. And just like Jesus, he was born of divine intervention. Maybe not to the same extent, but his parents were old and beyond childbearing age. So much so his dad when <laughs> said, how is that even possible, right? Ended up being struck mute. It was a, it was a whole ordeal. But it's important to realize his birth was uh, proclaimed by angels and, and through divine intervention. His, uh, John the Baptist marked an interesting time in human history because the Old Testament ended, and then John the Baptist really marks the beginning of the New Testament. Probably the birth of Jesus marks the ministry, but John was born first, right? So there's this idea that there's this, this gap between the Old and the New Testament, which is called the years of silence. Because for 400 years, the voice of God was absent of the world. The Holy Spirit of God did not speak for 400 years. There was no prophets. The Word of God was void. And then you had John the Baptist who came before Jesus, he spoke. He heard that he had the Holy Spirit of God from before he was born. So John the Baptist marks this interesting point in human history where he kind of bridges the gap between he, he, the, the, the law and the prophet, which is the Old Testament, and the New Testament, which is the ministry of the kingdom of heaven breaking into the present on earth, right? He had one foot in the Old Testament, one foot in the New Testament. He, he was a uniquely positioned person who was laying a foundation for the work of Jesus. His ministry was the culmination of the law and the prophets, and yet the heralding of the inbreaking of the kingdom of heaven. After 400 years, God had sent a new prophet to, to, to call back his people to him. His teaching was revolutionary, and it was foundational for everything that Jesus was to do, right? He laid the groundwork for Jesus. He, he was received the Holy Spirit of God. He moved forward. He was doing incredible things. And that in and of itself should be enough to credit John the Baptist, right? 
That, that kind of elevates him and puts him in a unique position. But here's the thing. He also baptized Jesus. And I want to share with you that account of baptism because it was a pretty cool thing. So in Matthew chapter 3, it says this. When then Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan to be baptized by John, John being John the Baptist, obviously. But John tried to declare, deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you came to me? Jesus replied, let it be so, for it is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and we saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son, whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. So what we have here, we have, so now that we see this story of John the Baptist baptizing Jesus, we go back. Let's recount about John. We see that John is the cousin of Jesus, whose birth was marked by angelic pro, uh, pro, pronunciation, that's not the right way of saying that, and divine intervention. He was born to parents that were too old to play catch. He was filled with the Spirit of God even before birth, called to be the one who bridged the gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And he lived his entire life devoted to the preaching of the kingdom of heaven. And beyond that, he was the one who baptized the Messiah himself in the Jordan River. He's the one who, when baptizing the Son of God, saw the Spirit of God descend upon him and heard the audible voice of God the Father saying he is well pleased. He had a pretty firm understanding. So when you go back to Matthew 11, this is the question he's asking. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Now that we have this context of who John was, the fact that he knew the Messiah was coming, the fact that he baptized the Messiah and heard God himself say, this is the Messiah, why is he asking the Messiah, are you the Messiah, right? Have you ever stopped to ask yourself, this doesn't make any sense. So let's dive in this just a little bit deeper, and we're going to ask two questions. First one's first, to really understand this passage, why is John in prison, right? How did he get there? We see him baptize Jesus. How did he go from that to prison? And second, what the heck is John going on about? Let's answer the first one. Why is John in prison? I mentioned earlier that John's preached repentance in the nearing of the kingdom of heaven. And part of that repentance was to bring the Israelite people back in line with God. So, and that's the point of a prophet, right? To bring the Israelites back in line with God. The cool thing about John is he did not pull any punches. Like, he has very few dialogue in the scriptures, but all of them are awesome. And in fact, I am a little disappointed in the fact that he gets to be as brutally honest as he is. Because I'm a little envious because if I were to speak to people like John the Baptist spoke to people, you would be emailing me, people would be leaving the church, it would be a huge mess. He's the one who first, the first person to say, called the religious leaders of a time, a brood of vipers, right? He made that popular and cool before Jesus did, right? He was hardcore. He really went after people and he did not pull any punches. And the thing is, uh, he might have also not only kept his ire, if you will, to the religious leaders, he also might have gotten in trouble with King Herod. Uh, in case you don't know, King Herod was kind of the king overseeing that, uh, the whole kingdom and whatnot. And, uh, and by when, when I say he, he might have gotten in trouble, he definitely did. Because he went up to King Herod and he rebuked him because King Herod had divorced his wife to marry the divorced wife of his, um, of his brother, right? And I'm not getting into divorce. So we're not going there, right? But this idea that he was not in line with God's plan. So, the, uh, so John went up to him and said, hey, you're not in the God, line with God's plan. So, of course, King Herod needed to protect his street cred, had to throw the dude in prison. You don't come out and you don't berate a king and not expect to end up in prison. The weird part about the whole thing is that King Herod actually believed that John was a man of God. He believed he was holy and righteous and had something to be said. So he was doing his best to kind of keep him safe in prison. But if you've never been in prison by a king, which you haven't, none of us have, it was not a safe place to be. At best, you were almost safe, right? But you were never far away from a beheading as John's going to find out. So he's in prison for condemning the king, uh, but he was also respected. So it was really a turmoil, tur- turmoil point in his life. But then all that aside, what the heck is he going on about, right? We just talked about him baptizing Jesus, seeing the Holy Spirit descend upon him. But then he's asking, are you the Messiah? 
Because if any one person at that moment in time would know that Jesus was the Messiah, it should have been John the Baptist, right? He kind of had preconceived notion from the Holy Spirit, as well as seeing uh, the Holy Spirit be baptized upon Jesus. It's an incredible thing. But quite simply, the reality is that John the Baptist was a human being, right? We as humans, we have expectations, we have hopes, we have dreams, we have desires, and John's no different. And yes, John the Baptist had the Holy Spirit of God, but if you have surrendered your life to Jesus, you too have the Holy Spirit of God. And let me ask you, have you ever doubted God? Everyone is shaking their heads. No, because of course, no one ever doubts God. We have the Holy Spirit. We have all the answers. But the reality is that's not true. We all have our expectations, and sometimes God doesn't live up to our expectations. And that was not different for John. You see, I told you that John lived in a time uh, 400 years after the voice of God had been silent. Yes, they had the law. They had the prophets. That means they had the Old Testament, and it was studied, and it was ter- interpreted, and it was uh, and, and eagerly awaiting this return of the promised Messiah was this nation of Israel. But the reality is, without the Spirit of God speaking into it, they had gotten a little bit off course, right? And at first, if you're a little bit off course with the, you know, the promise of the Messiah, you're fine. But 400 years of being off course by just one degree, you're going to end up way in left field. So John the Baptist, like every other first century Jewish man, expected the Messiah to come back. They were awaiting them. And, but what they were expecting was something radically different. They were expecting the Messiah to come back and lead a revolution. And I don't mean a spiritual revolution. Yeah, that would come. But they were oppressed. They were in, in slavery almost, if you will. They had the Roman Empire over top of them, directing them, leading them, guiding them. And they were expecting this Messiah to come back and to overthrow the Roman Empire. John was in no different than that. He expected the Messiah to come. He saw him coming, and he knew he was baptized. But, but now he sat in a cell waiting for this revolution to come. And while he was waiting, he was getting these reports from his disciples about the deeds of Jesus, and it was a little bit troubling. And to be honest, if I expected a revolution and I got the same reports John got, I would be a little worried as well. Those reports were not indicating anything that would be close to considered a revolution, right? Yes, he received reports of healings, of casting out of demons, of the dead rising. However, there was no mention about the raising of arms, like the preparing of armies, the, the drawing of banners, these this, this things you come with, these, these expectations of revolution. But beyond that, beyond the fact that he was just expecting a revolution, he also had expectations about how the Messiah would act. The Messiah was to be a holy, righteous, and kingly. He should be saintly, abstaining from anything that may give the illusion of unholiness. He should be even more holy than the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who he called a brood of vipers, right? Yet the reports were coming back, and those reports were reports of gluttony, of drunkenness. They were reports that Jesus was touching leopards and eating with sinners and tax collectors. John had preached his entire life to lay a foundation for this Messiah. He baptized this Messiah, yet he was sitting in a prison uh, waiting for the Messiah. He was sitting in prison for this calling. He expected the Messiah to overthrow the king, yet he sat in a cell liable to die at any moment. He needed to know what was happening. It didn't add up. This wasn't what he was expecting. He needed to know what was happening. He was expecting a revolution, a storming of a palace, a breaking of shackles, yet reports were coming back and they were troubling. Jesus was to be a king, a prophet, a priest, yet John was getting reports of him touching lepers and hanging out with sinners and ruffians. And worst of all, Jesus' reports, were he was laid back in maintaining the holiness customs. His disciples didn't even wash their hands before eating. That was a joke. They didn't, but that's, anyways... He thought he knew that Jesus was the Messiah, but was Jesus was behaving in such a manner that was unbefitting of a Messiah. He was struggling with these misplaced expectations. So he reached out for an answer, or rather he reached out for the most important answer he could ask. You can almost read John's question as if he is asking, are you the Messiah I was expecting? 
I was expecting you to be proper and clean and holy, yet you are trampling over the customs and holiness traditions. I expected you to be kingly, yet you're eating with the scum of society. I expected you to overthrow the kingdom, yet here I sit in prison awaiting my inevitable execution. <clears throat> are you the Messiah I was expecting? That's the question John asks, and Jesus' answer is a resounding no. I'm better. Jesus knew what John was expecting. He was expecting this revolution of a very real kingdom. Jesus explains to John through the use of fulfilled prophetic language that he is, in fact, the Messiah, and he is better than what John could ever have understood. You see, the first century Jewish culture had a narrow understanding of the Messiah in, in the culture of the time. The people wanted freedom from physical bondage, yet the Messiah came to break a very real spiritual bondage. Yes, he came to heal physical bondage, things like blindness, death, lameness, and death itself, but all those were a direct result of the spiritual bondage that came with the fall of man. Culture was wanting something different, something narrow and self-centered when you look at the totality of the circumstances of the history of the world. Jesus wasn't the Messiah that they were expecting. They wanted the Messiah to come and restore their former glory days of being a you know, superpower. But Jesus came and he wore a crown of thorns and he died on a cross because Jesus didn't come to fulfill first century Jewish understanding of the Messiah. He came to fulfill the biblical expectations of a Messiah. He came to usher in the kingdom of heaven. He came so that the blind can receive sight the lame could walk, and the, those who have leprosies could be cleansed, the deaf could hear, the dead could raise, and the good news would be proclaimed to the poor. That's why Jesus came. That's why he started the church, and that's what the church is about. So what does that mean, all right? We've looked at the story of John the Baptist. We understand the, he was approaching Jesus with these expectations, and if John, the guy who had all the answers, could still have a misplaced expectation of God, can we in 2022? Can we have mixed plays? I think the answer is yes. So I want to talk about, just briefly, we're going to talk about what some of these wrong expectations. We're going to talk about corporate, but more importantly, we're going to talk about in, uh, individually. So corporate expectations. We believe that as a church in 2022, we are being called to be a church that practices the ways of Jesus. We want to see the sick heal, the demon inflicted cleansed, the dead raised, the hungry fed, and the gospel preached to the least of these in our cities. You want to know how we're going to do that? You want me to tell you the direction we're going to go in? I'm not going to do it. Pastor Kevin's going to give you that message next week, right? Because I think the reality is that before we can get there as a church, we as humans, as individuals, as people, need to deal with our misplaced expectations. And these ex misplaced expectations come in two different ways. One of them is we have misplaced expectations of God. It's a dangerous game we play when, we, when it comes to expectations of God because oftentimes we base our expectations of God over anything other than what God said about God. Right? We base our expectations on what God's going to do on our grow upbringing, what our grandma said, what our pastor growing up said, what we saw on TV, what we saw on YouTube, what we hear on the radio, our expectations are often based in everything but that of the scriptures, right? We, we use our real world experiences to project that onto God. You see, our expectations of God often range anywhere from an angry, distant father all the way over to a, a loving slot machine who's just ready to give out good vibes, right? We have these vast and wild expectations. But what did God say about God, right? What expectations should we have of God? I think we can expect a few things. First thing is we can expect God to be God. I'm not saying he does everything so our lives are peaches, sunshine, and roses, right? I promise you it's not. If anyone tells you surrendering your life to Jesus is, the, is easy and it's never going to cost you anything, they're bold-faced lying to your face. John the Baptist ended up beheaded in prison. Heck, Jesus himself died on a cross. But we don't follow Jesus so we don't end up not having hard things happen to us. We follow Jesus because God promised that when we follow him, we will see the inbreaking of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. We can try desperately to hang on to the life that we want or what this world has to offer, but we know that that is all going to a lake of fire in the end, right? 
We need to lay down our expectations of what we thought life should be, what we thought God should be, and we should take up what he has called us to see, be. If we can trust God and it really place that expectation for God to be God, we can see incredible things happen. We as individuals will see bondage healed. I'm, not, I'm talking about physical pain, physical bondage healed. We will see emotional scars healed. We will see spiritual bondage broken at the hands of the kingdom of heaven if we just put our expectations on God and less on what we think God should be. He's been pretty clear about who he is and what he's going to do, right? But then comes the question, what does God expect out of us? Now, I'm not going to stand up here and uh, pretend I have enough time to get into all of this, right? Uh, books have been written, churches have been split, and relationships have been torched in the name of what God expects out of you, right? We oftentimes will add a lot of things to what God, but I'm going to give you uh, a summary of, I think, which perfectly encapsulates what God expects out of us. Because when someone approached Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, can you sum up the entirety of the Old Testament for me? This is a paraphrase, right? He said, can you sum up everything in the Old Testament? What matters? Jesus' answer was this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the answer to what does the Old Testament mean? How do you sum it all up? What is the expectation of the nation of Israel, right? It was to love God and love your neighbor. So I would dare say the expectation of us in this new covenant, the New Testament, is the same. Love your, the God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Quite simply, it's put easily and simply in front of you. Love God above all else and love people more than yourself, Right? It's this idea. It's that simple. All we have to do, the only thing God ever asks of us is to love God and love people. When you love God, when you love people, you will get to see his glory break into the present reality of our world. When you press into the kingdom of heaven and what God has called you to, you will see people healed physically. When you, when you press into what God has called you to, you will see bondage broken. You will see dry bones come to life, not because you are a part of a church who believes in the moving of the Holy Spirit. No, because you are called as an individual to do the things that Jesus did. Nobody rides the bench in the kingdom of heaven. Just because I'm up here preaching doesn't mean I have a bigger part. I, it's a small part. It's the least important. I'm just here to tell you, hey, listen, I read this in the Bible. This is what God says we should do. Maybe we should do it. Maybe we should do it. Because the expectation of all who follow Jesus is to live a life that call, lives like Jesus. But oftentimes, our expectations are off. Put. They're, they're in the wrong area. They're misplaced. I think today God wants to challenge our expectations. I think today God wants to physically, in, real, in reality, in this moment, not just say, hey, it, it'd be a good idea for us to revisit some of our expectations, right? No, I think God is saying, hey, if you want to be a part of what God is going to do in this church in 2022, you better expect God to do big things in 2022. So if you do not expect God to do big things in 2022, why not? If you don't expect God to do big things through you in 2022, why not? Are your expectations based off of what God said or what your parents said? Are they based off of what you thought your life was going to be or what God said your life should be? I'm going to invite the band back up because uh, I did go short. Good. God told me to go short, right? For a reason. Because uh, as we were preparing and saying, hey, should we pray for rock kids? Like, should we, should we dive into that? Or maybe we should have different people come up and pray about different things. Like, hey, this, uh, how, how do we want to reach our city? How do we want to do discipleship? And all these things. That's what I thought we would get into. But God said, no, because we need people to get realigned with the expectations of the kingdom of heaven. So we're going to move into an extended time of worship and ministry. And as I was praying through this and thinking through this, I, I, I asked God, what are you calling us today, like to do today? 
Why did he wreck the expectations of this year, right? We're two weeks behind where we thought we were going to be. We're going to have to revisit the calendar. It's going to be a nightmare. It's going to be a mess. Someone's asking what we're studying in small groups. I don't know. Are we going to have small groups? Yes, but we're going to figure, right? That's where we're at, right? We're all out of sorts. We have no idea what's going on, but that's not on accident. I don't, I'm not saying that God inflicted us with a pandemic. Don't hear me say that. But what I'm saying is the pandemic happened, but why? Right? Why did God make us pause and reconsider this? Because I think today, very really today, we're going to have some ministry time. We're going to have people up here. And I think God wants to deal with expectations. And I think these expectations come in a lot of different ways. The first expectation I really think God wants to deal with is there are people here who have unmet expectations from God. That you expected God to move in a certain way, yet God didn't move. Maybe it's that you were called to ministry and you devoted time and energy and sacrifice and built this ministry and thought it was going to go one way. And all of a sudden, you're, look, you're on the outside looking in, watching someone else lead a ministry that you were called to. Maybe it's time for you not, not to just say, well, that's God. And he's in control. He's got it figured out. Sometimes saying God's in control and God's figured it out is a big and easy escape for us not to deal with the pain. Because there's a very real disappointment, a very real hurt that comes when God doesn't meet your expectations. And for us to just pretend everything's peachy and all good and God's in control and everything's going to be fine, that's good to say, but God wants to actually deal with it. You planted, you cultivated, you grew, and you're watching someone else harvest it. That stinks. That hurts. You need to deal with it. Or maybe it's not even ministry related. Maybe you had an expectation of your life that you were going to. Uh, God, I always expected to be this, this full-time worker. This, uh, this, I was going to provide with, the hands, with my hands and feet. and I, It was going to be great. But for some reason now I feel like I, I'm on the outside looking in. I'm not able to get work, or you've called me to stay at home, or you've I've been inflicted with this, and I, I, just, I have these expectations I had of life, yet I'm not, you're not living up to them. You're not giving me what I thought. Maybe it's the opposite. Maybe you thought you were going to do something else. You thought you were going to stay home and, and devote your life, your energy to your family, and this idea that this is what God called me to. Then all of a sudden, you're years down the road, and you're further away from that than ever before. And you realize that that expectation might not be a reality anymore. So why? why? Again, you can say, God's good. He's got this. Everything's good. I don't have to worry about it. That's a lie. You're worried about it. It's eating you alive. Deal with it. But I also don't think it just ends with our expectations of God. I think some of us today are dealing with expectations of other people. Maybe it's uh, your parents, you grew up, you, you were told, hey, this is the idea of what it means to be a Christian. And if you don't live up to this perfectly, you're not a Christian. You're in danger of going to hell, right? And maybe there was a kernel of truth, but maybe there was a lot more things that weren't from God. You, and you're dealing with the fact that you are disappointing everyone in your life, that you're not living up to the life that other people had expected out of you. Deal with it. Don't just say everything's fine. I think the, the biggest lie Christians ever say is, hey, how are you? Good. No, we're not. Most of the time, we're, we're a living mess. Stop lying. Not because of me. I don't need you to. It's your life. You can lie if you want to. You're just going to be miserable the rest of your existence. I don't think God wants you to stay there. I think God wants to bring you out of those expectations that you are, you are good, that your heavenly Father loves you, that you are living up, you are doing it right, and you are doing a good job. Maybe you are built up on the expectations that you will fail, that you are a failure. But the reality is God's saying you're not. Come deal with that. And finally, I think there are people who have never actually dealt with the expectation God has of you. I think a lot of people grow up in the church or around the church and they think it all sounds good and they want to they talk about surrendering their life to God and they, and they do all that. But they haven't taken up the actual expectation of laying down their life. And I'm not saying that you're not a Christian, that you're not, none of that. No, no. What I am saying is, have you decided it is better for me to die to see the kingdom of heaven move forward? Or is it, I'm going to add the kingdom of heaven, but after I get my 401k figured out and set up, or after this, or after that, 
I think there are people who have not yet taken on that mantle of expectation that God has. And I say all this not to, again, it's not as a, as a club or as anything like that. I, I think this is a, an opportunity for us as a church, as individuals gathering together, to get kingdom expectations. God doesn't want you to be miserable. He doesn't want you to feel alone, but he wants to see you live the life that he created you to live. And it doesn't happen living in regrets and under the weight of expectations that don't belong to you. So as we move into this last song, we're going to have our ministry team come up. And if they fill up, we'll have more ministry people come up. And if they fill up, we'll have more ministry people come up. And if they fill up, we'll keep going, right? Because all of us in some way have unmet expectations. And I think today is a day you can draw a line in the sand and actually talk for the first time in your life about those expectations. I release you. I give you the freedom. God gives you the freedom to deal with the disappointments. God's big enough. He can handle it.